It's quiet influence. I am grateful. Today, I open my mind to spirit's quiet influence. That's my affirmation for today. I just read it. And um, it's good. It's good. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, uh, you know, Saturdays has been my day because I get to not even pretend that I was going to pick up a book or do anything else other than just um, straight talk, just talk. And um, and that is my plan for today. And it's, you know, it's, I don't, because when I come in here and sit down, most of the time I have no clue what I'm going to talk about, but at least I've done my morning ritual, which is um, in part to do some kind of um, movement activity. I could say exercise, but sometimes it's just um, me running up and down the steps or walking in a circle or dancing or something like that. But usually that's like, I do that first, trying to get the blood circulating through my body. And, um, and then y'all know I journal. Um, this is in between dealing with the dogs, I journal. And then I sit down in my meditation. And so when I sit in my meditation, I do my morning readings. So from A Course in Miracles and from Science of Mind magazine, I do those readings. Then I drop into at least a 15 minute um, meditation. And then I get up and I write um, in my book. And so this morning, because I went out last night, um, mostly all of that got, you know, off to like, like swept the deck on all of that. I haven't done anything as far as my normal morning routine, except for getting a shower, um, put on some makeup, combed my hair, <laughs> and uh, and came right on. Um, I'm so, but I'm so grateful that I'm here, and I was here on time, and so I grabbed my Kindle as I was walking past to, because I was like, okay, so I haven't done any of my normal stuff. So let me at least grab the Kindle and um, center myself before I start talking. G good morning, my love. How are you? Sandra was there last night. I did not get out of that place until, well, we got out of there at 11. Um, because I was part of the committee. We were, you know, we cleaned up. We got all the stuff together. And then um, we finally left. And so for me to get in bed at that time of night and still try to make it up at 5.30 was just not happening. So I, I slept clear until about 10 minutes to seven. And so none of my normal stuff, but all is well, all is well, I'm here. And so um, I, I got it. I, so last night was, y'all know that I've been talking about that class of 1982 whoop, whoop, <laughs> where was having like a 40th year celebration, something that um, was just, it, and to see all of these people and all of these faces from back when and, you know, we look good. We, we really look good. It was you know, and I know some people put a lot of efforting into, you know, oh, these people hadn't seen me. I got to, you know, clean up and put on my, uh, on my best or whatever. And so it was, you know, whether, whether they came looking just, you know, straight from work or whatever the case may be, you know, folks were really looking good. And I was happy to see everybody and um and it was it was just it was so rich for me so I have to be intentional about my picture taking today um because I I you know y'all know how I like to tag people on their birthdays and all of that stuff and so I you know I was thinking to myself I got to be intentional about this 
But the funniest thing happened to me last night. Um, and uh, I, I, I want to say, because it was a little, like, I don't embarrass easily. I'm going to tell y'all that. I don't embarrass easily. Because um, to me, everything, I take everything in stride. It's like, you know, this is, this is, <laughs> it is what it is. And so um, anyway, so, you know, I was, I'm, I'm that one that when I see people taking pictures, I'm always offering, hey, I'll take the picture for you so you could get in there. So Randy was taking a picture of him and some of the guys. And I told Randy, I said, I'll take the picture for you. So he says, oh, cool. And he hands me his camera. And as I'm standing there and I'm trying to take the picture, I, I kept looking at the screen and I was like, does your camera do autofocus? And he says, yeah, he says, just hold it. It'll, it'll, um, it'll, it'll, you know, find us or whatever. And I'm just like sitting up there and I'm looking. And so I just take a couple of pictures. I hit the thing, I hit it I hit again. And I was like, I don't know why it's so blurry. Could it be the light behind y'all? <laughs> And so, he, you know, I guess he was like saying, don't worry about it, right? And he comes over and he grabs his phone and he looks at the picture and then he looks at me and he's like, uh, maybe you should try putting on those glasses <laughs> that I had on my head. And I put on the glasses and I thought, oh, damn. <laughs> Am I that blind? I just... I put on the glasses, I looked at the picture and I just had to walk away because it was just like, oh my God, I'm making it, I, I'm making it the phone's fault. And so I'm always talking about the lens that we see life through. And um, you had a wonderful time. I sit in my car, I, I, you shed a tear. It was great. Oh, girl, it was. It was so good. It was so good to see everybody. I don't know how you got that in blue, but uh, it was so good to see everybody. And it was so good to see you. And yeah, and, and just, you know, there's that, um, you know, some of the folks, when they walked in, I immediately knew um, who it was. Um, oh, that's so sweet. Thank you. Um, I immediately knew who they were, but, um, you know, not always, not always in the midst of seeing people um, do I like remember right off. Like it sometimes takes me a minute. Like I had been, I had been watching this one woman and had no clue of who she was. And then when I finally got the name and recognized, oh my gosh, I do know her. Then all of these memories started flooding back and, uh, you know, and it was a whole different experience. Um, I, I did a dance with one of the guys and he was talking to me as we were dancing and he says, I don't think I'm in that yearbook at all. And I was like, I don't think I am either. Um, because at the time in those teenage years, I remember thinking, let's, you know, get on out of here with that. Like I ain't taking that picture. I can remember being resistant to that. I was resistant to being in high school, to be honest. I loved high school. Don't get me wrong. I cried when we had to graduate because I didn't want that part of my life to be over. Um, but the whole time I was in there, I thought I was, you know, I was above that. Um, and then people helped me to think that way too. You know, I remember... Um, people come into me like I was more mature and they were coming to me and asking me questions and all of that stuff. Um, but it has everything to do with the lens through which we see the world, you know? Um, and are we wearing corrective lenses? Are we going through the world with this blurred vision of, of what things are and trying to adjust the world 
instead of our own eyesight. And for me, that was such one of one of those like light bulb moments that, you know, I really needed to embrace. Um, because a lot of times what we do is, is we make assumptions and, and this blurred vision, it goes across the board. Do you know what I mean? We can have even, you know, even what people say, how they react, um, if we've got blurred vision in the first place, if we're used to confronting people or having people who we think have bad intentions, or we've seen, I, I've got, um, I've got friends who have, um, who are like, say, for instance, police officers, right? Um, police officers, and, you know, they are so used to seeing the worst side of life that they no longer trust when they see something that is good. They're looking for some kind of motive behind it. And you know that that was not how they always perceive things, but they become jaded because um, they look at the world in a particular way. So, so the same can become true of anything and everybody. Uh, depending upon where our focus is, we kind of shift our, our way of thinking around, you know? Um, and so, you know, somebody said, oh, you know, she was upset because I didn't remember, you know, uh, but, but that's not, you know, that, who knows if that is the case? And could that be her eyes, her perception, or is it reality? What's the lens that we're looking through? So if we are, um, say for instance, you know, we try to read things into other people's way of thinking, other people's ideas, their ideologies, all of that stuff. We try to read things into there that may not be there at all. We need to put on our glasses, right? And make the adjustment, allow for the correction of the distortion and that distortion may come with us. If we grew up in, um, in a household or in families that were always critical, we may take somebody's, you know, um, stuff as being a criticism. I can't tell you how many people said to me or how many times I heard, like, girl, you always dancing. You on the dance floor. You on the dance. And, and, and I have heard that both as a criticism before. And I've also heard it as a compliment. But you don't know whether the person means it as a criticism or as a compliment. And so what I choose to do is to not get caught up in trying to distinguish whether somebody is trying to tell me to sit my butt down and, and not be me <laughs> or whether or not they are saying, wow, look at you, you got all that energy. I don't know which one it is, but I choose to not even address it or deal with it because, you know, for whatever reason, their need to say it does not mean that I now need to make an adjustment to myself um, because of it. So, so all of this is just like us figuring out who we are and how we move through, um, how we move through these things. I heard somebody last night several times talk about, oh, you don't recognize me because I've gained weight. No, I was thinking, um, no, maybe, I don't know, I don't know, but, um, you know, <laughs> and then talking about the dug on, um, the dug on lens, uh, I was like, I said to somebody, this one woman walked in, and I knew her, I, I used to love her, oh my gosh, and I I don't know who I said it to, but I said, I don't remember her being that tall. And they said, well, look at her shoes. And I had to look down and it's like, oh, those platforms. 
duh. I just know that I'm looking up. It's like I'm breaking my neck looking up. And it's like, oh, never even dawned on me that it might be heels because I'm in flats. So um, so it's just it's just a matter of 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 compensating for the distortion, right? Of whatever that may mean. Just just recognize that that it may be, it may be that we need to figure out if we need corrective lenses or not. Um, and and that that to me is just is golden. Even looking back at what I was thinking when I was in high school that made me not want to be captured in the yearbook. What was my reasoning behind that? What was my thought? Um, and I may be in there. Somebody said one time that there was, you know, somebody caught me, but not in a picture that I posed for. I might be in there, but nevertheless. Um, and, and so the question becomes, I think, for, for all of us, what is it, you know, what is it that is playing in our thoughts and in our minds that sometimes is distorted by the experiences that we have from our past? Um, and, and so let me, um, I, I, I value being authentic, honest. I don't even know that I call it all of that. I just call it being me. Um, and so you guys that listen to me on a regular basis, you might know that my mother, I'm now 58. Right? My mother was 58 when she died of cancer. And what I know is, is that for a lot of our society, we kind of, uh, if, if your mother, if you had a parent that died early, there is a certain perception about your life as you move forward. Like the, the model for living beyond a certain point is not there. So it's kind of like you're moving out onto new territory, a new way of seeing. What is 58 supposed to be like? Is 58, you know, and I mean, this is just from me talking. Is 58 supposed to be hot and sexy? Is 58 supposed to go someplace and sit down, talk about what's hurting, what, talk about what's not in place, or talk about like life is over? Or is 58 like the midpoint? Like, you know, after, after, Dr. Brown gave me my reset, like the goal is a hundred. And if the goal is a hundred, I'm only at the halfway point. And if I perceive myself only at the halfway point, then how must I adjust my living from here on out to walk in the awareness of this is my halfway point? So if we stop with this idea that somehow a particular age is old and we are just rediscovering um, ourselves, wonder if we come up with that perception and then start operating in that awareness instead of the awareness that somehow we're supposed to be a particular way when we get to the age that we are. Um, I have I have lost myself on here and I'm wondering if um, <laughs> I don't know what I did, but I did something and um, and I have lost my feed, I think anyway. Um, ha, huh, interesting. So I tried to close out my window and, um, I did. And for some reason now I cannot find my window and I am trying to find it. 
Can somebody, if you were watching, can you just hit a like button for me or something somewhere so I can find um, where I am supposed to be? Uh, I wonder if that would work. I wonder if that would work. Okay, so the fact that it hasn't worked yet, maybe, maybe I have screwed up. Looks like a half, but I'm not going off in order to find where I'm supposed to be. Um, okay, so I see where Sandra has done. There we are. My <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, Twyla. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. Ah, oh, let me not do that again. Ah, oh, and now I'm breaking out into a sweat. You guys, I am so excited about the temperature um, change and um, and and be able to get some work in today. Um, that is that's good, juicy good. Okay, so so. If we are thinking about this in, in terms of what this means in our everyday life, right? If you think about it in, in terms of how you see yourself, what, what kind of um, restrictive behavior have you done because you have the notion that um, you're either supposed to be at a certain stage, a certain point, um, have accomplished certain things, or that you know, you're at the end of this, are you thinking about, oh, because I'm close to retirement, I should be doing this, or are you thinking about at your age, you should be wearing things that are age appropriate? What is it that you, based on, a, on, on what you've seen prior to and makes you adjust your behavior now? I, you know, <laughs> I think that it is hilarious to see people who um, who just follow the model that has been set for them without ever questioning what it is that they're doing. I I don't know about you, but I, so I got I got to talk about this because because I feel like I'm dancing around the edges of this. Um, so, you know, I was talking to, to one friend and she was like, you know, we, we said something about our libidos and sex. And she was like, oh, I don't ever have to do that again. And I was like, what? <laughs> what is good for you? You know how I am. I'm, I'm always telling somebody that, that, that it, you know, that this enlivens, it enlivens your life. And when you start to have these perceptions, the question is not necessarily, you know, whether or not you, your body still works, whether your body will participate, but then how, what is it that mentally has happened that you have turned off yourself to certain things? Now, I will tell you that there is a thing called learned helplessness. Many of us learned about it in college and learn helplessness is this idea that when something happens to anybody over and over again what they do eventually is is that they will stop trying so if you are told no all the time eventually you stop asking if you are told what you can't do, or if you've tried something, there is this, if you keep hitting a wall, then there will be a point at which you stop even trying. It is learned helplessness. Um, it, it, sometimes people condition you into thinking a certain way. Sometimes people are gaslighting you, which means that they may um, make it seem like everybody else in the world sees this, but only you cannot. There is a lot of stuff that has been done. And it is, I will say this, um, it, it, and sometimes it is a collective um, consciousness. So when we talk about it in the sense of a collective consciousness, we know that as people of color, 
we have been accustomed to not receiving fair treatment or that the deck being stacked against us. And so you don't even try to do certain things, you know, and as the tide starts to shift or turn and people are becoming more conscious, as things seem to open up a little bit, there is this like, wow, finally, you know, somebody is hearing me, somebody is seeing me. But this learn or this, this learned helplessness kind of permeates the experience. It is not just a human experience. Um, we see it in test animals, lab rats, all those types of things. You'll see it with your dogs. You know, the thing of once this repetition of, of something happening and occurring over and over again, people give up the will to even try. Well, if we look at our lives in the same instance, this idea around learned helplessness, in what ways have you felt like somebody has um, trained you to, um, to, 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 to expect a no or to not even ask anymore? Um, there was a idea about how do you train fleas? I, I remember hearing this story so long ago that it's kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly how it goes. Train a flea. And the idea of training a flea is, is that if you want them to have the perception that they can't jump, you inhibit their ability to jump. So if you were to cover the floor with something and they hit a ceiling, then they will only jump as high as the ceiling that is over their head. If you take a baby elephant and you know how big an elephant is and you put a rope around them and you tie them to a post as a baby, they may have trouble trying to pull a loose, but they stop even trying so that even when they get to be a older elephant, when they get to, you know, be the size of a, of a building or weigh as much, you can put a lightweight string on them and tie it to something and they will not pull that string because they have learned that the limitation is there. And so they don't even try anymore. Can you imagine how that plays out in each of our lives? If, say, for instance, um, I, I go back to the idea of sex. If you never, if you've never enjoyed it, then your expectation is, is that you never will. And maybe you, you, you might say, okay, that it may be the person that I'm with, or it may be this situation, but there is a uh, as you cease to try anymore. They got toys out here, y'all. <laughs> I mean, if, 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 if that's the issue, it becomes this thing of not just, just um, relinquishing and saying, huh, oh, well, I guess that's not for me. Yeah, life is too short. Life is too short. So, so if, so if I have come to that assumption that life is too short and my body wants to dance, I'm certainly not going to say, and my body and my mind, my whole being wants to dance. I'm certainly not going to say to myself, oh, you know what? These people won't understand if I get up and dance. No, I got to do me. And so I think that for each and every one of us, we have got to learn how to stop thinking and worrying about what other people are in, what they may be thinking or worrying about, and really instead do what it is that you love. Have you done your exercises? Have you been doing the mirror work? I mean, this is, all of this stuff helps because at a certain point, you will say, you know what? I love to dance and I love myself anyway, right? Or I love myself because I love to dance. So when the objections come up or when the, 
the things that, you know, uh, um, you know, I, I often tell the story about a mother who was, um, you know, her daughter was one of those little, um, one of those little people that was always, you know, fluttering around the house and she was dancing and she'd be singing and just having an amazing time. And it was just her natural way of being. But one day mom came home and mom was tired. Mom had been, had a hard day and just everything seemed like they were going, was going wrong. And, you know, and, and she turns around and she tells her daughter, would you shut up all that noise? Damn, I can't think, you know? Um, and and it, it was as if a light went off in that little girl that day, you know? Like what she had been doing all along wasn't noise. It was for her, this was, this was her expression. But the, the reaction of it on that particular day, little kids don't understand that, you know, that whole thing. Why? Why? In, in the Bible, um, there's that story about oh, the magician um, and the donkey. And, um, and this, the, the donkey was supposed to be going somewhere to say, for instance, the magician was riding on the donkey. And, um, um, and the way that the story goes is, is that the donkey saw an angel in the road that the magician didn't see. And um, now get that, there's magicians in the Bible, right? Um, and so the donkey stopped. And so the, you know, the magician was hitting the donkey, trying to tell the donkey go. And finally the donkey turned around and said, what are you hitting me for? You know, like asking the question, why, why, why? <laughs> and, and then it said that, um, that, uh, God lifted the veil off of the magician's eyes that allowed him to see what the obstruction was. And a lot of times, you know, we have this perception, this certain perception about, you know, how things, how things are. But because we didn't put on our lenses or because we don't have a clear vision of the entirety of the thing of, of whatever it is. Sometimes we get caught up in, um, in not seeing the larger picture. This little girl may have been spinning magic around her house. She may have been, this was her gifting to the world, but now the mother says, would you shut up? Quit making all that darn noise. And something went off inside of her. You guys, we are casting spells all the time. And there have been spells that have been cast over us over and over again. Sometimes something happens and it doesn't turn out the way that we think it should. And instead of trying again, or instead of recognizing, well, this, no Today doesn't mean no forever, but sometimes people just stop trying. You don't try out for the team or you don't um, raise your hand or you don't do so many things that at other times you would have, but because you have now learned something else, you've stopped even trying. But wonder if we just decided to take back agency for ourselves and decided like, you know, wonder if I try again, wonder if I look, take the piano lessons or wonder if I decided that I wanted to take ballroom or tango lessons or wonder if I decided that, you know, um, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe just take up skiing or that I really can sing. I, I will tell you my, um, I, I blame this on my sister, but my sister has always been so critical of my singing to the point of where if, you know, I used to like not sing at all. 
because she would always talk about, oh my God, like it was such horrid noise that it was unbearable, <laughs> like nails on a chalkboard. And so for the longest, I just didn't even, but you know what? It's even some, sometimes you go to, you go places and you hear people singing and they're singing and they're in their joy and all of that stuff. And all you can do is say, bless their heart because it's making them happy. And if it makes them happy, who am I to sit there and say, oh my God. Yeah. I mean, who's to say that we have to be perfect? And that's why I tell people all the time, when, that's why when it's karaoke night, I get up and I sing first. Because I'll tell you, I always say that my singing something bad gives other people permission to even sing mediocre. <laughs> that's, that's my theory. So if, if, if somebody looks and says, well, I can't do any worse than she did, then I feel like I have won. I feel like I have accomplished something that is big. If, if you just sit there and say like, well, I got to be better than that, then, then that's a victory, right? And so a lot of times we don't have anybody who does the kind of permissioning for us to try and fail. Our, our, our society is so based on do it and do it right, or do it and be perfect, or practice makes perfect, and all of this other stuff that people don't even want to fail anymore. Y'all, we got to be the space in which it's okay to fall on your face. It's okay. I hope I get to see Linda. Well, I don't know. Did Linda even graduate from, um, from Kennedy? But it's okay. It's okay to do things mediocre. It's okay not to be perfect. All of that is okay. And so when we get that in our spirit and stop trying to, you know, always be in this, you know, in this, oh, it's got to be polished. It's got to be right. If, if we could just bring whatever it is, you know, whatever, whatever piece goes into the soup, if we could just do our part, then, I mean, it just seems like that would just be perfect. But y'all, sometimes people quit before they even begin because we have this, uh, what is it? Black excellence, right? Well, why don't we try fall on your face sometimes? Why don't we try? Yeah, that's, you know, this is, this is what I got. <laughs> I mean, and, and that goes across the board. Um, we used to have this joke, this running joke when we were younger that my mother made concoctions and we would number them. Concoction number 267C, right? which would consist of her making something. I mean, she was always putting together weird combinations. And when it worked, it worked. And when it didn't, it's like, what? You know, I mean, who? Uh, she would put together cabbage and potatoes and something else, and she would just make it. And then we would sit in there staring at our plates like, okay, <laughs> we kind of like looking around at each other, like what concoction number are we at now? <laughs> It just be like, what the heck? But, you know, my mother was like, she would tell us, well, I'm not, no short order cook. You either eat that or you don't eat. <laughs> and, and so it was this, it was this thing of, of, you know, it doesn't have to be a picture perfect recipe. It doesn't have to be perfect all the time. Even in the imperfection, we have moved the ball forward. And so, you know, when I, I get up, I try, I've been trying to learn to dance forever. I get up, I don't do it right. I, uh, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm tripping over my own feet, whatever the case may be. But you know what? Every time I get back up, because I don't embarrass easy. I don't take it that I'm not intelligent because I can't understand or because I can't do a particular thing. All of those things start within you. The feelings of inferiority, the feelings of not enoughness, it's not, it's not 
them, it's you. And so once you, once you realize that you're enough as you are, once you realize I'm good enough and, and there, look, what you think about me is none of my business, right? What you think about me is none of my business. If you get that in your spirit, then you're easier, you're better able to get up and to perform. Oh my gosh. And so, you know, if, if I'm in that mindset, I can say to you, oh my gosh, what you think about me is none of my business. So if I'm talking today about sex, or if I'm talking about masturbation, which is to me the parts of the same whole, if I'm talking today about singing, if I'm talking today about dancing, if I'm talking today about relationships, if I'm talking today about you know um, the things that happened back when I was in high school, or if I'm talking about what's going on on my job, if I'm talking about how um, a particular report or um, or a training that I did was received. If I'm talking about any number of things, right? I, we can we can sit up and we can we can talk about it. And if you never even try, you can't possibly get any better because your trying has inhibited the part of you that needs to do something in order to see whether or not you can do it. Could you imagine if every day I was trying to be perfect or that I needed to memorize a script or have all of this stuff? I would, I would, I would, I would be, I would quit before I even began because I was thinking about how it needed to be or how I, how I needed to have it structured. That's not my method. I have to do what I do. You have to do what you do. So sometimes we have to adjust our lenses. Imagine if, um, imagine if you, ask somebody a question like, um, how does this look on me? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just trying to throw out an example. Um, or I'll give you a real life example from my life. Um, I wrote a short story and um, I, actually gave it to my brother to read because I wanted, I was going to send it in. I was going to send it off to be published. And my brother read the story. Let's say, um, this is the one that passed. Um, you got to consider the source too, right? He read the story. And after he finished reading it, now, mind you, he didn't stop reading the story. He read it from beginning to end. And then what he did was, is he took the, the, the little, um, cause I had it kind of stapled together. I had the pages stapled together and he took it and he threw it at me and he said, you ain't no writer. Now, so there's so many ways that you can, um, you could process that, right? You, and, and I mean, and it's not that I haven't had people give me feedback before. Somebody told me I didn't take feedback well. Because I don't respect your feedback does not mean that I don't take feedback well. Um, but that wasn't feedback. That was, you ain't no writer. 
and he then he proceeds to tell me about how he reads a lot. I'm a bookworm. I, I read all the time. You ain't no writer. Right? I never sent the story off. I mean, you know how that goes? I mean, you, you have intentions to do something and then somebody tells you In, in, in some cultures, it's okay, get up and try again, right? In some arenas, it is, you know, somebody comes out and shows you and says, okay, this is, this is the places that you've done something wrong. In others, especially because we were in the community, I was raised up in a black community where um, people might have smacked you down and they do it, it's kind of like spiking, you know, when if you've ever seen or played volleyball somebody comes right up on the net and even before the ball comes over it, they spike it and they hit it. Like, you know, how dare you even try to put this over here. In basketball, we be, you know, when somebody blocks a shot and does it really good, ooh, we making all of these noises, ooh, like, um, it's kind of like that smackdown. You ain't no writer. And it was me as, um, as a, a young person in this budding aspiration that I had to write a story that it got smacked down and it caused me to not to try. Oh, thank you, God, for this revelation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It caused me not to try. And so when you think about the things in your life that it may be some little bitty something that seemed like it shouldn't have overriding implications, but it does, that has caused you to stop trying. He rolls over one too many times without caring whether or not you got yours or not. Or they come at you with this, not even not even any awareness that there might be something that you need in order to make you feel receptive. Um, there's been so many times when we haven't felt seen, valued, nurtured, cared for and this is not just women this is men this is all of us sometimes we've been we have had others fail us miserably and we've learned how to stop even trying life is too short Life is too short to live it shackled, to live it halfway, to not ever try again. That brings to mind that song for me. Um, 
I hope you still feel small when you stand behind the ocean, beside the ocean. I hope that when one door closes, I hope one more opens. Promise me you'll give faith a fighting chance. And when you get the choice to sit it out or dance, I hope you dance. That's the song, right? I hope you dance. I, you know, I, I think that it is, good morning, Tracy. Hello, dear. I think that it is so important. I, you know, and, and Tracy, so, so, so now that you are here, like, Cause, cause this, I, I mean, this idea of not even trying anymore is when I talk about learned helplessness and, and Tracy is a whole sex counselor and sex therapist. And I always say that we're going to do a show on this, but when I was hearing, you know, when I heard my, my friend, same age as I am, a gorgeous, gorgeous woman. And I was like, you know, talking about, I said, mention some sex. And she was like, oh, girl, I don't even have to ever do that again. And I was thinking to myself, like, how sad. I mean, but that is, that's so much of life. So it's not just that, that people are like that when it comes down to sex. They're like that on their jobs. They're like that with their talents, with their careers, with writing, with cooking sometimes. I mean, you know, the people who, get, who, who won't even, um, my friend, Alan, um, if I say something that, um, say for instance, that I want to eat. Now he loves to cook, but he will not cook anything without a recipe in front of him. It's so funny to me. It's like, why don't you just throw some stuff in the pot? Why has it got to be, you know, measure this and measure that? Nothing. He, and put on the timer, you know, if it says for, um, you know, for, I, I love um, my tuna rare, you know, I like rare tuna. But it, if it says, you know, three minutes on each side, or if it says 75 seconds, he'll sit there with the stopwatch and, and flip it accordingly. It's no like just looking at it, eyeballing it. And if I'm telling him to eyeball it, he says, well, you do it because he can't do it that way. <laughs> um, and it's hilarious to me. But there are so many, so many things that, that people have have constricted this the shackles that we wear you know it's it's the shackles that we wear from that keep us from even trying to do something else and 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 sometimes we have the inability because here here's here's what here's the other thing is is that if it feels like we're saying that our needs aren't met, then that it's a complaint. I tell somebody, um, I tell somebody, oh, this, this, you know, I really wish that I was able to have seconds. And, and, and she took it as a criticism. I was like, that, to me, that's a compliment. If I said, I wish I had seconds, that meant it was good. Not, not, not that, <laughs> that I wanted more is a good thing. Um, but, but what she heard was a criticism and I'm just like, oh, okay. Uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, you know, do we make adjustments every time for our people's inability to hear? Because I say that I need more, you know, I like the, I like touch, right? It's not a criticism. It's simply acknowledging what a person needs. And if we never learn how to move past our discomfort, our discomfort prevents us from telling people what we want, right? So, so if what I want is, <laughs> you know, a little more spice in there, 
you're saying, oh, the recipe doesn't call for spice. Okay, but I'm, I'm you know, can, can I just make the adjustment here, right? Because, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's the feedback, you know, or the, the way of talking or the way of expressing, but to say that, that, that I have a valid, I have a valid desire here is not a criticism or a rejection, but rather it is, you know, maybe if we, if we, if we talk about, if we, if we get to the point where we're able to speak to to what it is. Had I asked my brother, well, what about my story didn't you like, right? You read the whole thing. It wasn't as if you got bored or it wasn't as if, you know, and I think I did ask him, right? I think I did ask him because I was like, it wasn't as if you got bored or something. You read the entire thing. What, what's wrong with it? And he started talking about my punctuation. The punctuation is not writing. That's what they make editors for. But still, the, the, the rejection was in my mind already. But that's what they have editors for. So a lot of times we keep ourselves from doing exactly what it is that we desire to do or asking for what we want or speaking to our own frustrations because we don't know how to verbalize it. It's nice to be able to say, you know what? I don't know how to articulate what it is that I'm feeling, but I know that I need something more. And I, I will tell you that it's, to me, it's a sign of respect when we invite somebody else into a conversation or a dance, right? Um, for me, it's like putting my hand out and saying, I don't know how to speak to this. But if we just like take this journey, if we take this walk together, maybe we can figure it out. Um, it, it requires us being vulnerable. Daring, caring. Um, Sometimes we shy away from those things because we got a cellular memory of rejection. We've got a feeling that somehow I don't deserve what it is that I want or that what I want is not possible. I've been there, I've, I've done that. It's not possible in that particular arena. And then when, when you think, okay, um, it's not possible, then you see, you know, sometimes you make adjustments and you see, okay. Ah, all of this, you know, all of this. I hope you, I hope you try. I hope you try. I hope you consider that it may be me. It may be you, right? Adjust. Adjust your lenses. Yeah, man told me to put my glasses on and I saw, oh my gosh, it's perfect. Like, damn, that's a good picture. <laughs> but I needed to be willing to make the, and I'm so glad that he said it to me. I'm so glad that he, you know, that, that he was keen enough to say, oh, you know, maybe you ought to put on those glasses. All right. And it's not hard. <laughs> it's not hard. All right. Um, I'm going to let, let it be there. Um, it is, uh, I'm after nine and I'm, uh, yeah, I got, uh, I got a lot of work to do uh, today. And um, yeah, 
so it's it's me moving towards the the hour but I mean you know it's funny because I feel like I've kind of like danced down a couple of different streets but all with the same kind of intent in mind and um and as I look at this I'm just I'm I'm considering what's there for me I believe that I have hit upon a particular awareness about um about my own stuff and even as I told you about what my my brother's reactions to my writing and um I so so let me let me um let me kind of bring this full circle I used to write a lot um because I'm a Pisces and I used to tell people all the time that Pisces are the dreamers right we daydream and I used to make up stories in my head like endlessly um as I was washing dishes or cleaning house or or laying in bed I would have epic dramas unfolding in my head um and so sometimes I would write sometimes I would write to kind of try to bring um them into focus for other people um my brother telling me that I wasn't a writer was a significant like wall for me it was an, a, a significant like bam boom um and so I, you know, that feeling of not wanting to be rejected um, went into, may have been in part the reason why I stopped writing nonfiction stuff in the first place. Um, didn't stop me from talking because uh, I get such joy out of this, but um just to think about you know when you think about the the things that you had once done maybe still have a desire to do when you think about reasons why we don't put ourselves out there in a more significant way i mean just just to sit with that for myself um may mean that somebody else who is listening or watching has um experience this level of learned helplessness in some area of your life. Um, and, and we owe it to ourselves to investigate or to at least try to, to move in that direction. Um, I remember telling myself that if, if I was daydreaming, it was because I wasn't fully living in my present. And so I stopped myself from these um, epic dramas that would unfold. It's like when I show up in life, I stop with the dreams. And that was what I really wanted to do at the time was to to stop like, you know, it, you know, it's kind of like I could be in my head, like reading a Harlequin romance. Well, I didn't want to read a Harlequin romance. I wanted to have a Harlequin romance, right? I don't want to be reading about somebody else doing something. I want to actually do it. And so I gave myself permission to start living and stop dreaming about it stop dreaming about living and start actually living that's you know for me that was a big deal it was a game changer but now living to what degree am i living to the out on the edge or am i still playing small so just questions you know this this if Look, if the shoe don't fit, don't wear it. But if you see something in that that is for you, yeah. All right, y'all. Thank you. I I'm, I'm getting off of here. I've 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 uh, I've I've done this. Um, Sandra, Twyla, Tracy. Thank you, Denise. Thank you. I I appreciate y'all. 
I will, um, I'll be on here tomorrow. Tomorrow is Sunday. I'm on at one o'clock. Somebody told me yesterday that they listened to me on Sundays. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. It's just so cool. Um, then I got classmates that listen to me. Uh, I, I mean, you know, it's so cool that all y'all listen to me. But, you know, it's just so amazing to me. I feel so honored by your attention, your time, all of that good stuff. Um, and maybe one day we'll have a conversation about, what you know, even with, you know, I'm going to throw it out there, Tracy, that we'll have a conversation about how to ask for what we want when it comes down to um, satisfaction. If you need more, you know, like the warm up to how do we get there, you know, or if we've been so disappointed over and over again, we say that this ain't going to come from you, right? How do we, how do we make those distinctions? I'll never forget in, um, is, is it American pie or apple pie or something that uh, George Clooney played in? Um, he was laying in the bed next to his wife and I think he thought she was asleep and all of a sudden she lifted up and she looks over and she says, are you masturbating? <laughs> and he was laying in the bed next to his wife masturbating. I thought that was the most hilarious thing, but isn't that how it is sometimes? <laughs> just whatever. I mean, just, y'all you know, just whatever. Hey, have an amazing Saturday. Um, and, and, you know, laugh, laugh at yourself, laugh at life and do the exercises. Don't forget. I've been talking about them now for three days. Double it every day. You know, I love you. Just say it. It's simple. I love you. 25, 50, 100, 200, double it every time. All right. Yeah. On the other side of this. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. If we could just, if I could just, if we could get everybody in the world to love themselves, right? And then we say, love the neighbor as thyself, right? If we could just get you to love yourself, oh my God. Yes, we can do a talk, how to ask for what we want in bed. Yeah, in life. Yes, 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 yes. All right, have a juicy day. <laughs>